Um, it's, little, it's like 11, 12, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Himanshu Devetti, and I work for ISEC Partners. Um, and the title of my talk today is, I'm going to shoot the next person who says VLANs. Now, I'm not going to shoot anyone who says VLANs. Um, I'm a fairly nonviolent person. Um, but I am going to talk about the cop-out excuses that I hear with storage vendors who are saying, we use VLANs, therefore we don't need to secure our products. Um, there's a couple quotes I'm going to put in this presentation from storage administrators and storage companies. I'm not going to put the names of the companies that use excuses like VLANs. And you know, you're probably asking what kind of VLANs, and that's where their answer stops. They just say VLANs and they walk away. We don't need to worry about authentication because we use VLANs. To me, that makes no sense or it makes very little sense um, as your entire security solution for your storage product. So a little bit about myself. Um, here's a few books I've written and um, some tools I've written. If you are interested in storage security, um, you can get a free copy of my book. I have a few of them I can give away. Um, but the two tools I'm going to be talking about today is called SNAP, Storage Network Audit Program, and Secure NetApp, um, a tool to basically assess a NetApp filer for security settings only. Um, so here's the agenda for the next 20 minutes. Um, and I'll be around, of course, to ask uh, for anyone who has questions. But the main, two, the main focus of this talk is, again, SNAP and Secure NetApp, the two tools I'll be releasing today. And also, there will be some CDs floating around here that look like this. If you want a copy of the tools, um, they will be on our website um, at, at the end of this week. But if you want a copy right now, they'll be on here, as well as the Black Hat CD that's already in your packets. Um, so the VLAN myth. So there's a difference between broadcast VLANs and private isolated VLANs. Now, in all the customers that I've worked with, I've not ever seen a private isolated VLAN deployed in a backup environment, meaning that 3,000 port switch is not using 3,000 private isolated VLANs. They are using broadcast VLANs, but there's a big difference in terms of security. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but saying that we use VLANs and therefore we don't need to turn on authentication is not a security solution, especially if it's broadcast VLANs. Other excuses I've heard are firewalls. We've all used that in all, we've all heard that in all industries. Uh, one of my favorites are the third one down, which says you need to authenticate to the network. Um, this excuse came from a storage vendor at a storage security conference when I was talking about iSCSI attacks. And um, as I showed um, Ethereal sniffing the network, someone interrupted my talk and said, that's not possible. You have to authenticate to the network. Um, when I asked him what he meant by authenticate, like, was he talking about 802.1x or something? And he's like, no, 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 you have to authenticate to the AD domain to get access to sniff the network. Yeah, exactly. And so I was, you know, luckily I didn't have to answer the question. Someone else from the audience kind of told him that's not correct. Um, but these are the things, this is the information gaps in terms of stores and security that I see or I hear every day. You don't need to authenticate to the network to sniff the network. Um, one of my other favorites is the third one down. Or, yeah, the third one down, which basically says items used for security today in storage network storage products weren't necessarily meant to be used as security. So it's actually a fair statement, meaning that there are things like in fiber channel SANs or iSCSI, like zoning and uh, discovery domains that are used to segment the network, that are also used for security, but they weren't intended for security. But the problem is that there's nothing else left. If you don't have anything, if you don't have seat belts in your car, and you use airbags for your entire safety method, you know, that's not the best thing to do, but if you don't have seat belts, that's the best thing you got. And so storage vendors aren't deploying the most amount of security that they could because you know, they feel that VLANs or firewalls is good enough on the network. They feel that other things in the network is okay enough for them to not spend any time, money, and energy to secure their own products. So again, VLANs are great, I love them, I like them, I wanna marry them, but when you're talking to a storage administrator and they have a network that's as complicated as this and you have Exchange, you have backups, you have SAP, then you're gonna have Oracle and you gotta have that fully redundant and you're gonna have to make sure that it's up all the time and you have SQL. You have all these things, it gets really complex. And what happens more times than not is that, not that it can't be done, it just doesn't happen. People don't use private isolated VLANs in this type of environment. Now, people in this room know it can be done. We can all use private isolated VLANs, but think as yourself as a storage guy who is responsible with deploying a storage network. Do you really want to manage a private isolated VLAN that looks like this if you're a storage person? It's like asking a security person, it's like asking me, like, I want you to build an iSCSI SAN that's really high performing and very fast. You know, I don't know 
anything about performance. I know a lot about security. So I'm just going to set it up to make it work and so it doesn't break and I'm going to walk away. And that's the same thing the storage person is going to do. They're not going to worry about VLANs. That's networking's job or that's security job. They're just going to make, so those, make sure those broadcast VLANs are working and they're going to walk away because they don't want to VLAN this. Even though they could, they don't. And that's the big difference, that there are things you could do. You could also use a crossover cable, but no one does it. You know, who's going to use a crossover cable? You're going to use a DAS environment at that point. So, one last thing about the VLAN myth, and I'll go on to the true topic of the talk, which is, this is a, basically the VLAN environment that I've seen. They broadcast VLANs by floor, floor one, floor two. So if the attacker wanted to attack other entities on their VLAN segment, they could, such as this iSCSI, server um, running exchange or this filer on the second floor. But yes, they couldn't attack the filer on the first floor. But it, is, is that good enough? Meaning that, okay, if you want to do these iSCSI attacks, you can't attack everything. You only can attack the things on your particular broadcast VLAN. To me, that's not good enough because once you have a, a control of a storage device, like an iSCSI storage device, you can have potentially access to everything, not just your little um, your little picture of it because a lot of SAN technologies are, once you have access to part of it, you can kind of um, map out the other LUNs and get access to most of it um, by simple brute forcing. So this is the environment where I think people are talking about when they use things like VLANs, that everything's isolated, that this attacker can't see the SAN manager, can't see any exchange server. Now that's great if it happens, but again, in my experience, I haven't seen it happen. It's just too much of a management nightmare for the networking team or the operations team to manage that across a true, a true SAN. Um, I'm going to skip over the slide a little bit, but it just talks about, you know, the VLAN approach, meaning that storage products need to be secure. You know, they're holding private information, they're holding credit card numbers, they're holding backup information. Now, it's not all in one place, but they are holding sensitive information. Now, if it's a public company, then you're exposed to Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA, if you're a medical organization, all this information that you need to protect. Now, just because a lot of people don't know about iSCSI or Fiber Channel does not mean that's a security control. And maybe that you use broadcast VLANs, well, that's not a security control. You need to enable authentication. That should not be a huge discussion um, with the storage team, but it still is, unfortunately. So, instead of me, um, bitching and moaning every year at Black Hat about the security problems that I find, I decided to take a different avenue this year and provide tools that are going to help organizations understand what their storage security problems actually are. And hence, that's the, the first tool I'm going to demonstrate, which is called SNAP, the Storage Network Audit Program. Um, I originally wrote this tool uh, for Chapter 13 of this book, um, and I released it in PDF form, and got a lot of good feedback, but didn't see a lot of good traction. Um, just like any PDF that you see out there, it's not really an actionable tool to people to go out and use. You know, you have like 30 pages of audit topics, of audit questions and answers. It's kind of intimidating. And if you're not a storage person, you're not going to know all the terminology. If you're, not a, if you're a security person, you probably know the idea, but you're not going to know all the iSCSI terminology. So what I decided to do is provide some automation to it. So there's the PDF version. Um, here's the idea of SNAP which is you have an audit topic. My goal was to provide any technologist, whether they're security or storage, the ability to get a topic, give them the uh, questions, and depending on the answer from the stand manager or the IT manager to understand what is good and what is bad. So if you're a security person and you know you have a SAN or your customer has a NAS environment or you're thinking about iSCSI, um, it'd be nice for you to go learn about those technologies you know, in a week, but that's probably not possible. Um, what is better is if you can use something like SNAP, you ask these questions to your SAN administrator, they give you the answers, and you can clearly understand how good you are in terms of security. And you'll often find there are solutions that I've seen that are very, very strong in terms of security, um, but it doesn't happen by accident. It's usually someone locally who is aware of the issues. More times than not, it's the unawareness that causes the problems of, you know, things like authentication being disabled, or if you, if you have a fiber channel SAN, things like uh, node worldwide names being used. So in this first example, you see worldwide names. Uh, if, again, if you're a storage person, you know exactly what that means. If you're not, you probably don't know or don't care. But the questions here about what type of worldwide names are going to be used. Now, if you use port worldwide names, that's very good. If you use node worldwide names, that's very bad. Now, you can see they sound very similar. So if you're a security person and not a storage person, you're probably like, okay, that really makes no sense. Hence, the whole reason to automate this tool to allow people to use it and clearly understand what settings are good and what settings are bad. So this is an attack I showed at Black Hat 2003. 
Uh, I'm not going to go over it, but this talks about some of the confusion that still I see today about spoofing. A lot of people say it's, spoofing is not possible, but basically the attacker here on the bottom of the screen can change their node worldwide name, which is still a common use um, entity, entity for security, and spoof it to anything they want, but they would probably spoof it to something they want to attack, which is the trusted server on the top. So they, choose, uh, they spoof their value to match the value of the entity on the top. They submit it to the fiber channel switch. The switch recognizes there's a duplicate value, overwrites the preceding value with the new information, gives the storage um, array to the attacker. The first one is knocked off the network, and therefore they have access to the data. The same, or I'm sorry, the solution to that, to prevent that attack, is you use poor worldwide names. The second attack is from iSCSI. So Fiber Channel, one of the old arguments was, well, you have to have access to the Fiber Channel SAN. That is very, very true. There's multiple ways to do that. Again, that's a different talk. But in iSCSI, that goes over IP. Um, and that, where you don't need to have a Fiber Channel card in your laptop or your desktop. You just need to have um, an iSCSI driver built into your laptop, which is made by Cisco and Microsoft and whomever else you want to download it from. But anyway, the same attack class, instead of worldwide names, you use initiator node names. Um, again, you can sniff that over the network. You don't need to authenticate to the network or anything like that. Um, the storage device has a mapping. Um, basically, this IQN um, above from the trusted client is the one that has access to all these secure LUNs or these data LUNs. The attacker, again, spoofs that information, which is driven freely away from the network in clear text or even from a um, simple name server that's not using authentication, which is, again, by the default. Um, they go ahead and change their um, initiator node name, send it to the storage array. Storage array sees the information, duplicates it, or it sees it's a duplicate, overwrites the existing one, gives access to the data to the attacker over the network. So to prevent this attack, you use mutual authentication, which is very different from the solution that we just talked about, even though it's the same attack class. So that's the whole idea of SNAP, that the solutions for the exact same attack type were different. And that's where a lot of confusion I've seen in storage security, that people might think there are problems or might be aware of them. I, but again, there's nothing out there to really help them along. Um, on one side, you have people like me saying there's, there's problems, you gotta do something about it. On the other side, you have the storage guys saying, ah, well, yeah, there are problems, but go ahead and just use VLANs and you'll be fine with it. Which, you know, to have some kind of um, control, um, I'll go ahead and demonstrate the tool I wrote, which is, again, SNAP. So SNAP is a question and answer tool. You just go ahead and execute it. Um, hopefully you guys can see that okay, but go ahead and name the audit, so I'll call it um, Exchange SAN. And so basically what time at SAN you have, if you have a NAS with SIFs or NFS, if you have iSCSI, if you have Fiber Channel, you kind of just choose the option that you want. So we're just gonna choose uh, Fiber Channel SANs. Um, and then it presents an audit topic, an audit question, and the answer. So you go through this questionnaire, so for example, um, the audit topic in this example is worldwide names should be difficult to spoof or enumerate. Um, and then the question is what type of worldwide names are used, port worldwide names or node worldwide names. Again, most of them are node, um, but depending on what your environment is or what the SAN administrator is, what I've been trying to start doing is using this tool and just giving it to SAN administrators in a very non-intimidating environment. You know, oftentimes when you're a security person from an external company and start asking a storage guy's questions, they get really like, you know, they do everything perfect. Um, because they know if they do something wrong, it's going to either be a lot of work or, you know, you know someone might, might get in trouble. So instead, if you hand them this tool and you say, okay, just go fill out this tool and send me the results and then we'll talk about it afterwards about how secure the SAN is. And again, there's things that can be done today, but again, the communication between um, the people who implement the SAN network, which is usually the vendor, and the owner of the SAN, which is usually the company, is very, very bad. There's not a lot of communication, in, especially in terms of security. So you go ahead and answer all these um, questions one by one, and I'm not going to go through them because you don't need me to read to you guys, but um, once you finish the audit program, and you can see there's a lot of questions. So that PDF file that I initially released probably was good, but not a very actionable thing to use if you're truly, truly trying to secure your storage network. Um, at the end of it, you get this nice, you know, very plain HTML, HTML report that will tell you clearly what settings are good and what settings are bad in terms of security. So again, you don't need to be a storage security expert to use this tool and definitely the answers you get back, you go to your SAN administrator and say, okay, looks like we're using soft zoning. Soft zoning is, um, is bad according to the audit program because you can do a lot of zone hopping attacks which are similar to the old VLAN hopping attacks you could do with Cisco equipment. 
Um, so therefore, you can go and have an um, intelligent conversation about, okay, our SAN is not very secure because of these settings. Or it might be very secure. You might have all satisfactories, and therefore, you know you're sitting pretty good in terms of your storage network. The next tool is called Secure NetApp. So SAN is a very broad, generic tool that covers iSCSI, um, NAS, and uh, Fiber Channel. So the next tool I wanted to write is specific to a storage product. Um, I chose NetApp, one, because I'm very familiar with them. Um, two, um, they're the, probably the most dominant filer I've seen out there in um, enterprise environments. Um, I'm not saying, in terms of market share, I think they have the most, but I don't have any statistics on that. But I see them, I see them most, especially for home directories, for file systems, file servers, um, backups, truly, not true backups, but uh, um, somewhat uh, hot backups for, for like exchange, well not exchange servers, but uh, file servers running on Windows. So I wanted to write a tool that would be specific to a storage product. I would love to write one for like EMC, Blue Arc, HDS, all these other companies. Um, but I started with NetApp because I think it had the most impact right away. And just like any other operating system, NetApp under, you know, a NetApp filer is an operating system. You know, just like Windows, Solaris, Linux, whatever, there's settings on there by default that are bad. These are all the things that you can do, um, plus a lot more that's not on the slide that you can do to a default NetApp filer if it's not using the strongest security controls that it could. Um, and there's a lot of things you can do, but again, they're just not implemented very often or very well. So this is an attack I demonstrated on um, Black Hat 2004, same attack class, but again, a different solution where a, basically a client can change the UID and GID um, and then basically present that to the filer. The filer, again, trusts anything that com that's coming from the client, um, which is not a good thing, and it go ahead, goes ahead and gives permissions to files that they don't have access to based on the UID and GID. And this is a very, very, very old NFS attack, and I had a customer probably not even three months ago was still vulnerable to this attack class um, because they didn't know they should, enumer or they should um, enable mutual authentic, or I'm sorry, enable Kerberos authentication with their NAS environment, which filers, NetApp filers have been supporting for years. Um, customers are just not using it. So um, one thing that NetApp did, which I thought was really good, is um, produce a publicly facing document of all the security settings that you could use on their filers themselves. Um, the problem, again, it's a, it's a Word document. It's a lot of settings. Um, it's probably intimidating to most storage people and security people. Um, so to kind of automate that is the whole reason to build the secure NetApp tool. So to demonstrate that, we'll go ahead and pull up secure NetApp. Now before I pull up the tool, let me talk to you a little bit about this file. This is an options file in a NetApp filer. So if you go ahead and hit options on the filer, you get all these settings. Just like, you know, Windows settings, Solaris settings, you get all the settings you could have on the filer. Um, some of these deal with security, some of them don't. Um, so the whole idea here is to go through this in a very automated way um, and to understand what settings should be enabled or disabled. So that's called filer options. So you go ahead and pull up secure NetApp. Um, you can do it three ways, SSH, Telnet, or local file. We're going to use a local file. I don't recommend using Telnet. It's kind of ridiculous if you're doing a security assessment and using Telnet. At the same time, unfortunately, a lot of filers don't enable SSH still. So anyway, um, we're going to use local file. Uh, the name of the file, we'll, we'll just call it um, home directories. Um, and then the name of the, uh, the file that has all our options, which is filer options to that TXT. And we hit enter. Oh, it's filer options, sorry. So I couldn't find that file. Home directory. Filer options that txt. And there you go, it shows us all the settings. Um, it looks a little bit better in this file. And this shows you all the settings that are either satisfactory or unsatisfactory on the NetApp filer. And so um, for example, one of my favorites is uh, Restrict Anonymous. We've all known for years that should be disabled on a Windows environment, but again, by default on a NetApp filer, it is, it is not disabled. So here's something that you need to go ahead and click on. And again, if you're a security guy, you probably know, don't know the syntax, but this tool will tell you the exact syntax to disable Restrict Anonymous. Again, something that has been around since NT4 that people have known about, 
But again, on filers, 99.9% .9 of the filers I've seen out there, they're not enabled. So this tool will help mitigate the gap, you know, you know, and just like any tool that you use, there could be something that's written unsatisfactory here that your organization doesn't believe in. And that's great, but to create the awareness knowing that, okay, this setting is uh, known to be insecure, but I'm gonna go ahead and accept the risk is a, is a big step. You know, accepting the risk is a big step versus not thinking there is not a risk. And that's one of the uh, other goals of using a tool like this is at least understanding how secure or insecure your NetApp filer is. Now, if your file is using for home directories, again, backup, um, you know, file systems, whatever you're using it for, more than likely it's not sitting on a Windows server or a Solaris server. It's sitting on some kind of uh, storage device, whether it's BlueArk, um, NetApp, um, whomever, it's probably sitting there where all the sensitive data kind of uh, finds its way to. Okay, I know, I know I'm going through this quickly, and I apologize, but uh, one last section, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, so with the popularity of like storage and people running out of space on their laptops and desktops, Netgear produced something called a home SAN called the Z-SAN. Now, to be honest, I wasn't very interested in this because I don't really think that home storage devices probably need to be the same level of security as enterprise solutions like a NetApp Filer or BlueArc. Um, but one thing that kind of struck me about this product, it does advertise its security controls, especially when it's holding financial information. So if you look at this arrow, uh, Netgear actually says that, you know, password protection adds additional, additional security to sensitive files such as financial records. So it's kind of encouraging users to store their financial information on this home ZSAN. Um, well, if you're going to encourage people and kind of say you have additional security, you're pretty making, you're making a statement that, you know, the security is a, a little bit above the basic stuff, which we all know is like clear text, you know, stuff across the wire. But just like, you know, the enterprise storage vendors, um, the home SAN solution didn't pass the grade either. Um, all the passwords are stored in the registry. So in this screenshot, you can see my password, which is 2% milk, is stored in this registry hive. Um, but more importantly, everything goes across the network into clear. So not only does it go across the network into clear, but it goes about 20 times a minute. So every time you read, write, or just have that vSAN on your drive, 20 times a minute, your password, which is password in this screenshot, goes across the network over and over and over and over and over and over again. So if you didn't get the first 19 times in the first minute, you'll probably get it uh, eventually if you're looking at it. Um, so that's for one of the LUNs, one of the disk drives in the SAN itself. But the good news or the bad news is the same idea is for the administrator password, which is the entire um, disk array on your home SAN. That also goes across the network quite a bit um, for UDP 20001 in clear text. So what I found was interesting is when a company says they're using additional security, yet they're doing these very basic um, bad security measures. And when you're talking about people that store their financial records on here, you've got to be at least you're using some kind of strong authentication or encryption, and none of that's happening here. But again, you know, if you look at the, the big boys in terms of storage, you know, some of them are coming around, but some of them aren't. Some of them really push back and saying, you know, security is not going to be a problem for us because, again, we use VLANs. Okay. Um, in conclusion, I think I have like five minutes. No, I don't have five minutes. Oh, I'm done. Okay. So, in conclusion, um, I'll, I'll be around. Um, these are the two tools. Again, the tools are on the CD if you want it. Um, I, I will be around. Um, here's my email address for questions, concerns, disagreements. I'm doing a book signing today at 1230, if you're welcome to come to that, um, if you want. Um, a little bit about ISEC and about our research. There's another um, ISEC person giving a talk today on Ajax, Alex Stamos and Zane Lackey. Um, but that's about it. Uh, so thanks for your time. And again, I'm sorry I ran out of time for questions. Or, I, there's one question.